Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Lecture 6C of our Residential Technology course. In today's lecture, we're going to do a follow-up to Lecture 5C where we looked at drawings and we looked at constructability from reading drawings and trying to visualize things better so that you know how to construct things. And so in today's uh, comparison lecture or follow-up lecture, we're going to be looking at detailed drawings. And we're going to start by looking at detailed drawings associated with the TACBOC details, uh, Toronto Area Chief Building Officials Committee. And many of these are taken from Chapter 4 of your Understanding Construction Drawings for Housing and Small Buildings textbook. So we'll be going through that. And we'll also be going through the brook drawings uh, that also accompanied the book. Uh, and I'm going to just walk through the details, so some of the details that are indicated and how you can visualize and interpret the information. And so you get a better sense of the information that details show and are indicated on the drawing and what it really means when you actually want to build it. So we'll start off by just discussing a little bit about details. And it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's giving you more information than you see from just a straight elevation drawing or a straight plan view. It's generally cutting through something and looking inside, like looking inside a floor or looking inside a wall. Or it may be a whole section detail through the whole building and you're looking inside the building. So it gives you a lot of very, very useful information that may be more difficult to visualize if you don't have it. Very often though in residential drawings you don't get a lot of details and you do have to visualize this information by looking at the floor plans, looking at the elevations, reading the construction notes, sketching it out, and that helps you to better uh, visualize it as well. Um, so when we say uh, section details it's really just referring to the cutting through and looking at something inside of it. Uh, we very often use cutting plane lines to help us to look at where are we cutting through it and which direction are we looking at once we've cut through it. These uh, next few uh, slides are from uh, TACBOC, which is Toronto Area Chief Building Officials Committee. And they kind of got together and put together a listing of details that are pretty standard details. Uh, and it's interpreted from the Ontario Building Code. Uh, I think the most recent ones they have is actually from the 2012 Building Code. Uh, there's been updates to it since, but it's a really good, even though that's a, a few years back, it's a really good indicator of what you're looking at and what you're trying to understand uh, from the information. So this is a, a section detail through a whole house from top to bottom, and this is your footings. Uh, over here is your floor slab, uh, here is your blocks and your block coursing with the joints in it. There's a break line through here which is separating the upper from the lower. It's just meaning that this would continue on. So whatever your height is doesn't really matter other than uh, this would continue from top to bottom. So of course our footings are where the foundation is resting and it should be on undisturbed soil. Uh, it has to be at least four foot below grade, uh, which means that um, it has to be below the frost line. And for our climates in uh, Canada, and, uh, and that's for a heated basement. So we've got also indicated a bunch of hatchings on this drawing. So you can sort of see this is uh, hatching for in bad insulation, and this is for rigid insulation. This is rigid insulation on the outside of the wall. This is a siding on the outside of the rigid insulation. You can see where the sill plate is placed and the location of the sill plate. So this is giving you some highlights of where that would be placed and that dash line is the anchor bolt that would fasten the sill plate to it. Uh, we've got bad insulation in between the joists. They even put rigid insulation against the wall of the rim joist and they call that the rim joist, the outer joist. Uh, circling the building, if you will. Sometimes they'll call it a perimeter joist. Uh, so then we have our wall, and that's why you have a bottom plate, typical top, double top plate, so that's the X pattern through it. You've got your insulation in the attic. This is really showing the hatching like it's a bad insulation, but it's actually would be a blown-in insulation of some sort. 
you also see here you have a vented soffit, just like you've seen on the brook drawings before, and you see it on the Doncaster and Whittington that's in the textbook. And so that allows air to flow up into the attic space. And when we talked about roof construction before, as you recall, um, there should be one to 300. So minimum one square foot of ventilation to every 300 square feet of, uh, of ceiling space. And so that insulation, should, that vent should be 50% at the soffit and 50% up the roof. It could be a ridge, ridge vent, it could be a roof vent, so that air will circulate and flow. And if any moisture gets into the attic, it will carry that away and dry it out so it doesn't become moldy. So there's a lot of uh, structural information here that you can sort of see. In this case, they, they're indicating uh, blocks. Um, if, if it was a uh, block wall, the top course would be filled solid uh, and uh, that would be just to make sure that it's solid. You'd have it knocked out where the anchor bolts are, and then that would be filled solid. Uh, usually they'll put some you know, waste pieces in the holes, and then they'll fill this up with uh, mortar. Uh, if it's uh, reinforced concrete, uh, then as it could be, it's not really indicating one way or the other with this detail because they're just trying to show you the different ways that you can construct it. On your actual construction drawings, it'll say it's poured concrete or it's concrete block. It won't beat around the bush about it. Uh, so we have here our space above grade. We've got our hatching for what grade looks like. We've got the grade sloping away from the building, minimum 200 millimeters. Uh, when it's uh, like a siding material from grade, that would be straight from the building code. Uh, there. There would be a header wrap. It's talking about a header wrap here. And that's that little dashed line that goes around here, comes up here, and comes there. And then it says seal header wrap to vapor barrier. Well, in this case, it's actually an air vapor barrier. And that's the poly that goes on the inside. So you see that dashed line? Consider going around. That's our air vapor barrier that's going around the interior of the envelope. In this particular case, it's acting as both an in uh, air and vapor barrier. Um, so we have a number of uh, other things that you can see. The shingles going up the roof. It's talking about putting down a building paper up so far. That's the eave protection that it's referring to. It could be a building paper. It could be um, an ice and water shield. An ice and water shield is like a, a rubber peel and stick membrane that when you nail the shingles through it, it seals around the nails. So if you get any buildup of snow on the roof, we call it ice damming, where this melts maybe a little bit over at the eaves because it's colder out here. It may freeze up and um, uh, cause sort of an ice blockage. And then as the rest of the roof kind of uh, melts the snow, then what happens is the snow gets underneath the shingles and it could enter into the house. But if you have ice and water shield, that's going to go a long way to preventing that from happening. Uh, and we've got our joists, we've got our subfloor, and the subfloor runs right underneath the, the bottom plate. So if you were to sketch this out, you should show that the subfloor goes right to the outside and the walls sit on top of the subfloor, right? So you'd build your, first thing you would be doing is building your footings, pouring your footings, then you'd be doing your foundation walls all the way around. From there, the next steps, of course, would be putting in your weeping tile, putting in your, uh, your um, gravel around the weeping tile. Uh, so that would be allowing to drain. Uh, before I'd put the gravel, of course, I would, put, I would have my foundation sprayed with a bituminous coating if it's being damp proofed. And then there's a drainage layer. Remember, you can go back to um, chapter six and look that up if you want to see a bunch of pictures of that. And so that's the, the foundation being built. Once that's all inspected in that, you would backfill it. And the back, of course, it would be inspected before the gravel goes on top so they could see the actual um, weeping tile in place. So then backfilling is putting the earth back that was excavated out. And then at that point, you will be uh, putting in your sill plates. And hopefully before you backfilled, you had bracing on the foundation wall. So if it's a long straight wall that it doesn't, you know, collapse or crack on you, temporary bracing. Then the sill plate is placed around the outside of the house. 
and then we frame the floor joists on top at the various spacings that we've discussed before 12 16 depending on what the what is going on it if it's 12 inches there might be a longer span for that size of joist or it might be that you've got ceramic tile on top of it uh, if it's 16 inches it's just what it was listed on the drawings and so then you'd frame your walls on this floor and then you'd raise them up and once you raise up the walls and brace them and straighten them uh, and all the walls are up, then the next thing is you're going to put up your roof trusses or your frame roof, depending on what it is that you're utilizing uh, on the particular structure. So all of that is looking at this particular detail. And this is looking at it up close so you can see it a little bit more clearly. This is the part that's above uh, the first floor. And then you've got what's below anchored to the actual foundation wall. And this is called the eaves, and that's your fascia. This is your soffit. In this case, it's a vented soffit. And that, as I mentioned, allows the air to flow up and around. Very well insulated. You've got your, your poly on the inside, meeting building code requirements. You've got your uh, bad insulation in a two by six wall. And then you've got rigid insulation on the outside of that, acting as a thermal break against the wood and lumber on the uh, wall. Close up of the foundation, you can see everything pretty close. The, the slab for the foundation floor goes in a bit later, uh, usually after the framing is, is done, but not too long after that. Uh, so you'd have all your drains and everything uh, plumbed and roughed in under the slab before you, of course, um, pour your uh, uh, slab concrete slab and then this is put in afterwards so in this case they're showing an actual frame wall with a bottom and top plate this would be non low bearing it shouldn't be carrying any weight ideally you would even have a little bit of space there so that it's not actually taking up any weight on the foundation wall and then they've got rigid insulation to the outside probably from a building science point of view it would be better to not use bad insulation in the basement Probably your best bet would be to use either just rigid or to use a, a spray and foam insulation against the, that wall uh, to um, act as your, your separation. Basements are always damp and you don't want to have any moisture that leaks into this area here. Uh, excess moisture leaking into that area, which sometimes occurs, even though you've got a, an air vapor barrier. Uh, it stays in there and so that can give you a musty smell or could even cause a little bit of uh, potential for mold depending on the moisture levels, the temperature, etc. So this is exactly the same idea. This, the one exception is it's showing brick veneer. And so we just looked at exterior finishes in chapter 10 and that's brick veneer. And so here's a good detail of it. And there's your airspace. You can see a little bit more clearly uh, you would have your weep poles down here, okay? So weep poles, maximum 800 millimeters apart. It's just kind of showing it there. But the truth is it'd be between every third brick or so. So maximum's 800 millimeters. So um, you can uh, figure out how far that is apart. And so any airflow would allow to go up in this cavity and it would vent out through the top where you've got this vented soffit. Now what you don't see here is the brick ties and the brick ties would be fastened around here and they'd be fastened to the styrofoam through the styrofoam into the studs. So uh, in that lecture, I mentioned that the brick ties have to fasten to the actual studs of the wall. And if you're sitting there uh, not sure what brick ties look like, if you look at the previous uh, lecture um, 6b, you'll see at the end of it, I've got a little uh, example of the brick ties shown, or you can Google brick ties and you'll see what they actually look like. Uh, just a thin piece of metal, but that's what gives the total strength and attachment of the brick veneer to the wall. And their spacing and height requirements are um, building code specific. So um, that's giving you that information. So you can even read it and understand what it's saying now. Brick veneer wall. Uh, the space uh, face brick, thick width of the, the width, so that would be 90 millimeters it's saying, 25 millimeter airspace, that's one inch airspace. This is the thickness and gauge of the galvanized metal ties, and they would be placed here. And that's why it says 400 on center and 600 millimeters vertical. But 
only 400 on center if your studs are 400. So if they were different, you got to make sure that they're going into the studs and that might affect because it's an area calculation height or the width of the spacing, as I mentioned in the previous video. And so, yeah, we've got uh, those aspects of the continuous air barrier and vapor barrier. So you see how the sill plate is towards the back of the foundation wall here. It's leaving room for the brick to rest on the foundation. It generally sticks out a little bit, the brick. Uh, the building code has a maximum that it can stick out based on the width of the brick. So it varies depending on the um, width of the brick, but it's usually you need to have it stick out just a little bit because by the time you use a two by six uh, plate and um, have it fastened to the wall and the size on the wall and the airspace, it usually um, protrudes much like the, the image there. Close up uh, here. Um, shown and you get the you get the idea here this is showing for a wall section detail for a heated crawl space and that's the heated crawl space so you got the floor frame everything's the same for like siding you got 200 millimeters there just to re recap it's only 150 millimeters when it's brick and you've got that space from the grade up to the underside there You've got your bad insulation. Everything else is pretty much the, the same there that we've talked about. Difference is one is unheated crawl space and one is heated. So that means this area would be um, this area would be a heated crawl space or what we call conditioned space. And this would be unheated or unconditioned space while this is conditioned space. Uh, this tends to be not as good because um, you feel the cold. It's like being over the garage. It's always it's always tricky to fully insulate the floor over a garage in a house um, where the second floor goes over the garage. Here we've got our uh, cut through. This is for the Doncaster house. So it's cut right through. You're looking inside of it. You can see the footings here. You can see how this uh, is a sunken laundry area. So it drops down 380 millimeters. If you recall from video 5C, it dropped eight inches, all right? So this is actually dropping two risers in this example. So that's a little bit more sunken than the previous uh, brook drawings example that we looked at in the previous um, lectures. So you get a good idea of the cut through. You can see the slope. You can see the cantilever of the um, box window that we talked about in a previous lecture when we did the wall, wall floor framing. So it gives you a pretty good section cut through. Here's a good example of a porch drawing uh, for a foundation. And I think we uh, looked at this a bit when we looked at the foundation uh, chapter. Uh, so you can sort of see looking straight down. Uh, this is an unheated area, so a cold room. Uh, it's got a doorway cut through it. It's showing you the um, cutting plane lines and the direction you would be looking at each one. And you can sort of see uh, over here, this is actually showing you the roof line for the roof that would be going over top of it, showing it like dashed line. This is your rebar and your spacing for the, the rebar is listed. So it's temperature steel, two, 10M at 200 millimeters on center and bottom reinforcing 10M at um, 200 on center. So the temperature steel is going the long direction and it's just to counteract expansion and contraction, whereas the uh, bearing steel is going front to back, the bottom reinforcing, and that's why it's on the bottom. So the one that goes crossword, crossways would also be on the bottom, but it'd be right on top of the other rebar. So it would probably be seen there. So there you go. So you can see the bottom rebar is underneath and then the top one goes over top of it but it is it would be placed closer to the bottom of the slab than the top of the slab and so that's falling down in the particular stairs but from a constructability point of view just looking at these cutting plane lines and thinking about where they cut through and what that means to me building it what am i looking at where am i standing what do i see in this particular point so section a you got to be really cognizant of section a and section b and where is that and what is it i'm looking at right so it's over here it's over there that's what i'm looking at 
Um, so when I, and I'm looking in that direction of B. So I'm looking wherever the arrow points. And that gives me a good understanding of what I'm looking at. And so this is uh, the brick veneer with a block backup. Uh, this is a cut through right through the whole, whole porch. Now, if it was really done, you, you could see you'd have another A that would show you that it's all the way through. So it doesn't, you, some things you have to infer when you actually look at it. And that's fairly common with drawings. You just got to get used to that. It might be, oh, it would have been nice if they had it coming out here and showing there, like it does when it cuts through the whole house. Uh, but on something small like this, they might do it just like that. Then there's general notes, like there is construction notes on your drawings in your textbook that gives you more detailed information about things. Things like the spacing between the pickets, things like the um, exterior walls, uh, exterior stairs, and this is straight from the building code. So you can have your rise, um, which is your unit rise, which is from top of tread to top of tread, is can be anywhere between 125 and 200. Your run, which is from the back of the riser, back of the riser to the front of the riser, right? So it can vary anywhere from 210 to 355. And when it says that the tread, the tread is counting um, the actual nosing. So if there was a, a nosing on this, a nosing is the part that sticks out on the stairs. So think of your stairs at home, that little part that sticks out. If you have a nosing, you can go up to 25 millimeters wider with the nosing. And that's part of the building code as well. So you see 210 plus 25, 235, right? Um, for the what maximum width of tread, they've got 355. So either way, nosing or no nosing, that's the widest you can go. So those, these notes typically are straight from the building code. And they're flexible because your height from the ground to here will always be different. So you got to make sure that all the risers are exactly the same height. So you can't have, you know, one or two different. They've got to be consistent at the same height when you lay out a stairs. So there's that information I'm looking at and I'm thinking about my situation. I'm thinking about how far out is this going to come? How many, how many risers do I want to have? Because I may be able to adjust things with, to have one more step or one less step and still fit the criteria uh, just by squeezing, you know, making a tighter uh, unit run or making a higher unit rise. I might have some latitude that I can still fit within the parameters, which will give me more. Maybe if there's, if there's another building over here, I want to keep as much space here when I come down the stairs so I can turn around, right? So those types of things. You're always constrained with space when you're designing things. And we'll look at stair layouts and design in another um, class. Here's a few details that I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear on. And I think we've looked at these in our other stuff, but this is a good review as well. Uh, if we have a roof rafter tying into a frame wall, probably the easiest way is to just uh, fasten a plate to the wall. And then you can have the rafters um, sit on hangers. That would be one way of um, doing it. Another thing that you could do is as well, uh, with um, with uh, your this sort of layout. If it was brick veneer, you could actually have a plate. Usually what they'll do is they'll use a three quarter inch plate against the wall, have the rafters come against the three quarter inch plate, and then do the bricks around the plate. So if you look back at uh, chapter nine, I think it is, or eight, actually it's uh, either eight or seven, you'll see where the brickwork in the front living room kind of went around the rafters uh, as it went up the wall. And that is what would be behind it. So that would be a very similar detail. Um, the only difference is they wouldn't use inch and a half, they'd use a three quarter inch plate because remember there's one inch airspace with the brick. So that gives you enough space that the brick could go right tight there because you could be tight at this point because above here, you're gonna have a flashing that's gonna come up underneath um, your shingle so that any moisture would run out if it was brick like here. Now this is showing you like if it was a renovation, you would have to cut holes through and fasten it to the wall. That would be one heck of a job to do, but in a renovation, it might be what you have to do because you can't fasten 
the structural roof to the brickwork. So typically in new construction, they wouldn't do that. They put a little plate here and then they would have their rafters in place and then they would brick around the actual rafters. So that's the difference. And of course, there's your, um, you would have a through wall flashing and this would not be uh, correct. The through wall flashing should go right over to here and up there. So if you're drawing a detail for this, the correct way to do that, that is to have your through wall flashing go right through the wall and, and then up behind here and it would be behind the building paper. All right, it would be behind the building paper. Um, so that would be what would have to occur there. And I think it's actually listing it there. It's just not showing it very, very well. It says counter flashing minimum six up six inches up wall embedded minimum. Yeah, it's still not, that's still not right. It should be a through wall flashing because otherwise any moisture could get down and go through down into here, which would not be um, a, a good situation, particularly if you had a window or a garage door opening or anything like that. This is for a solid masonry wall and for a solid masonry wall, uh, again, we would have, that would be fine for a solid masonry wall with the cap flashing like this, that would be, and the counter flashing, uh, that would be fine. It doesn't have to go through the wall. This was all, all be filled solid with mortar, this joint here, this collar, collar tie joint that we call it, collar joint. And then this could be fastened with lag bolts through the brick, through the wall, because then this is considered a structural wall. Here's a detailed drawing for a deck. And in the deck, uh, we've got uh, a, a cutting plane line B and a cutting line plane line A, and you've got floor joists moving in this direction. So you can see the floor joists moving in this direction uh, and they're at 24 inches on center. Uh, so for a deck, uh, they're a little bit wider spacing. This would be assuming like you'd have a two inch and a half inch thick um, deck boards. Uh, if you're gonna use anything less than that, then you better be going at 16 inches. And some uh, composite materials, you even have to go at 12 inches on center. So you have to look at whatever decking material you're using um, for the deck, but you also have to look at the spans. You'll see at the end, I think there's like a sample of spans for joists for deck, decks. Uh, and so there's a, these are, these circles here would be what we call sauna tubes. And the sauna tubes are drilled into the ground and the concrete's filled into the sauna tubes. And then there's what we call um, stirrups that are put into the sauna tubes. And then our posts can go into the syrups, the stirrups. Uh, and here, you notice these are patio stones that are being laid because you want no wood to soil contact. Uh, wood to soil contacts, a no-no with the building code. Uh, you can have termites that will infest the wood and eat their way up through the, the wood. It's gonna, even if it's not termites, moisture is gonna de decay it much uh, prematurely. Um, so um, that would be um, why. Uh, here's the sauna tube so you can sort of see how they are. They again have to go minimum four feet below grade to be below the frost line. You've got your floor joist coming out. It's cantilevered over at this point, maximum two feet. And this is your stirrups that it, the post is um, fastened to. And we have to make sure if we're going to have a rim joist that's on the edge here for the deck that that would be bolted through to the inside. Uh, in this case, they're showing it's double uh, ledger boards that it would be fastened to this way. But um, if you were going to do it up here, it shouldn't be just fastened to the brick. It needs to be fastened through the rim joist. If it's an existing house and you're doing it, you could do it this way and that would be okay. Also, you've got your minimum and maximums. It's giving me a lot of information for what heights I've got to put the railing at. And again, it's over five foot 11 above grade because more you have to fall, um, it does change the actual overall height of the railing. So if you're more than five foot 11, they want the railing to be at uh, 42 inches. If you're less than, if you're five foot 11 or less, uh, then you can get away with having it 35 inches high. Detail of the stairs, looks like there's two two by sixes being used for the treads uh, in this case. And it's just showing you um, the railing heights, handrail heights for going down the stairs and uh, how it's being fastened and put together. All right, and remember this is, your, this is your rise and this is your run. 
and this is your nosing. The part that sticks out is your nosing. This is just showing you a, a pier and a beam sizing, and so this is based on um, the span and the loading for the deck uh, that's being um, used. And we talked about um, different um, uh, loading. So this is your your uh, weight pounds per square foot. So this is actually in Imperial still. Your best bet is not to use a table like this. Your best bet is to use the building code tables because you never know how things get outdated, etc. Um, from things. Even though it is TACBOC, things change very rapidly, more rapidly than even they keep can keep up with their um, details. So that's not bad. Let's, that's giving us an idea of details, but let's take a look at the uh, brook drawings and see what we can um, look at what details they've got on on this set of drawings and so actually maybe we'll start we looked at some of these the last time and i'll get this turned around a little bit we looked at the flat roof detail now you got an idea of the through wall flashing and see what i was talking about through wall flashing so it goes right through that's better that's the way it should be um, going up and over with the paper going over top of it um, some sometimes drawings you gotta be careful because in even you know, tack block drawings, uh, you got to be a little bit careful of uh, that it's giving the, the right detail for a particular instance. Um, so we want to have that separation. So if any moisture gets in behind the windowsill or uh, behind the brickwork here, it's coming out above the roof and then it would be taken away by the scooper drain or scupper drain. Uh, this little angled piece here, I don't think I've mentioned that before, is what we call a cant strip and it just keeps the water sloped towards the middle area of the deck and the deck would have a slope a two percent slope on it uh, to towards the scupper drain and if you have trouble understanding or visualizing what does two percent mean well you could say on a hundred inches it's going to go from two inches to nothing right so or 50 inches it's going to go from one inch to nothing that's how um, the slope is but it is a slope and it does allow for the water to run off. So it's not a perfectly flat roof. In this case, they're asking for a rubberized roof membrane uh, as opposed to maybe a traditional tar and gravel roof. Um, but that's what this is calling for. Uh, we also see lintel to bear on SB in the main wall. So that just means to bear on solid bearing. And that just means that you'd have it on jack studs going inside the wall. Uh, so you get uh, an idea of here and of course we have uh, engineered joists that were used on the brook drawing so it's showing the engineered joists. Here's a section of the shed roof which is this section right over here and these little dots they infer a hatching for spray foam. So likely this spray foam would be um, a half pound foam that is um, polyurethane foam that would be sprayed into um, this this area here right uh, and over here we have uh, over here we've got uh, our interior it's not an interior wall it's an exterior wall but we've got a window here and there's siding and there would be siding on the outside of this wall as well and if you're not sure about that you could go and check that and the reason there's siding here too is it would be difficult we'd have to put beams and a whole bunch of other things to carry the weight of the brick here. So this makes it a lot simpler. They have the brick veneer on the outside. So if I wanna see what that looks like, I'd have to look at the um, elevation there. And so you can see the siding. So you gotta get used to the ref. When we talk about details, you gotta be able to reference and look at where things are. So this edge here, this edge here, and then this here is what we're looking at in that particular um, detail. Well, that, cut through of the whole building section detail AA for the whole building and so that's exactly what we're seeing we're seeing through this window and we're seeing um, the outside of the siding we're seeing the brick veneer so the siding would fit into that and if we were looking for a section AA we just have to go look at a floor plan and you'll see the section AA running running through it at some point uh, probably best to look at a whole floor plan there we go and so there's your section a a and that's running right through that window and it's looking in that direction so that's why we see the brick in the siding over um, there 
And that section X is, I believe, should be that roof. Oh, uh, maybe not. There's another section X somewhere. Just have to go down to where we were, where the cut through is. Oh, there it is, okay. So we will. So there's our, our section um, um, X uh, in that particular part, section of the roof. I think um, you're really looking at both details when they're looking at that, but they don't show the spray foam over here because it's not necessary. Uh, we have that, yep, that was where our section AA was going through. So, and this, by the way, I didn't mention this the last time around. Uh, we can talk about this a little bit more uh, when we do the building systems, but this is the floor plan for all the electrical. So they did a separate floor plan, electrical plans. Very often they'll do the electrical on the same plans, but if you get many pot lights or different things going, they'll very often separate it. This is fairly straightforward though. Could have been on the regular floor plans, but they did do separate ones. And um, they do have any showing any possible differences they might have between the elevation A and the elevation B. I'm not sure that I see any major differences between them, but they have them done anyways. Uh, so that's just quickly showing you um, from the basement that the switch is upstairs and that would operate all of these lights off of one switch. Uh, that's also um, looking at from the upstairs. Uh, so then you can sort of see the lights are switched here. There's a three-way, so you could switch on here, switch off there. Uh, there you can see the kitchens are switched. You can see where the outlets are, and this switch operates that outlet. So all the particulars for the um, lighting um, layouts and the symbols are used. And if you weren't familiar with the symbols, you could always go to the... Um, you could always go to the construction notes and then they would tell you what these various symbols mean. Like this is a waterproof outlet, uh, so it's outside. So those are where the symbols come in. That's for a hose bib outside. This is for your fridge, this is for your stove, your island. Um, all of these points are covered uh, in the electrical layout drawings. Uh, Three-way switch, That's it's hard to see, but that's S3, that's S3. And that means I can switch here, walk, open the door, switch there, walk out. This is a outlet and it's gonna be at 43 inches above um, ground. So some outlets, they'll give you a measurement for how far above the counter it's supposed to be. Again, you can't see it too clearly there, unfortunately, but that's telling how where the outlets have to go and uh, for what purpose. And this is like a special outlet for a stove, which is gonna run 220 volts. Just like this is for the washer and dryer upstairs. That's a special outlet for the dryer. It's the stacked washer and dryer that I mentioned, I think, in the previous previous lecture, 5C. So getting to more details, let's just curve this around a little bit. Uh, maybe make... Okay, we're back. And we're going to be looking at uh, some details that you'll see later in the Brook drawings. This is on page 19, I believe, listed as 17 of 19. Um, so uh, we're looking at uh, the plan view of the back deck and uh, some of the differences and details that it shows for the deck. Uh, and some of the details have to, it's kind of dependent on uh, what the grading is like for that particular house on that particular site plan. So we've talked about how the site plan can vary from house to house. If you recall in lecture, uh, the lecture that we did on foundations, which was based on chapter five, uh, we saw the Doncaster house and we went through that sort of view around the site plan, how it tapered and went down um, that ridge there. So it was a semi walkout, did not quite a walkout. In some houses, it's flat, right? And the drawings kind of indicate that it's flat. So this is showing you some options here on this page and the next page uh, regarding the deck at the back. And so depending on where it is, and again, getting used to uh, how details may be shown or indicated takes a little bit of uh, time and getting used to. Like they'll have like a circle around it and it says C. So then I would look at this circle and that would be um, 
uh, C, right? So it may be pointing to um, a particular detail and we can sort of uh, get a hint of what it's um, reviewing or what it's actually um, looking at. So for example, let's see, um, following this down, we can see here a cutting plane line B, uh, A, and then we got a circle around E. So let's take a look at B. Uh, we've got a cantilever here, so that's where the, the deck is uh, cantilevered out. So it's just looking at that part of the deck that would be um, sticking out. So you got your boards going this way, and so we're looking at it. There would be a beam um, going across this direction. Your joists are running this direction here. Uh, and because they're going to run the short direction typically because that allows you to use um, shorter joists and you can see the joists are indicated running this and you can see it says two two by eights running to the sauna tubes and the columns very similar to the details that we looked at earlier from chapter four uh, in this lecture for the other deck uh, same idea so it would be on concrete filled sauna tubes very typical uh, for decks on stirrups and then that would be placed uh, on the, the beam would go on top of them and then the joists uh, would go on top of that and be cantilevered outward so there's your um, beam and there's your joist resting outward from that so it gives you that that um, look and it says five four decking that's inch and a quarter decking it's a little bit thinner than the two by material uh, that's used on top uh, it shows it like it's a two by four by scale, but I doubt that. Uh, I think they would use at least a two by six uh, for that, or one. The one by four usually comes in one by four by six. I've not really seen it so much in one and a quarter by f uh, six. Not so much uh, uh, that. Oh, it does say six inches. It does say six inches, but if you look at from a scale view that's not six inches that's actually four inches because that's a four by four post and that's about the same width so you see sometimes there's little inconsistencies they're not a big deal but you do have to um, try to interpret things for if you're going to buy it and you're going to build it just be careful uh, number of steps uh, may vary with grade so whatever you see here steps well that depends on where the ground is right and so that depends on the finished floor to the grade requirements and how deep you excavated and followed those measurements like we talked about in chapter five in the earlier lecture that we did on foundations. So how deep this is, is dependent on the layout of uh, the actual building. So like this detail here, it may be true, but it may not be true. It may be that this is much lower. This might be way down here. It depends if you've got like a kind of a semi walkout basement probably more like a semi walkout this illustration or a walkout basement in that case this would be here and the walkout part would be there so it depends on where the grade is falling depending on the topography of the site and how the house has been uh, situated for height on the lot that's why over here it's saying you know what you could go with a much um, you could go with a wider window if uh, the stairs if there's fewer steps because if there's more steps then they're going to go further into this particular area right so it's giving different choices um, um, for the actual uh, different uh, window points you actually you may be able to go with uh, the wider window if, depending on how far down this goes you might have more choices for that so it's just saying there's some choices there depending on how many risers you've got up to the first uh, floor and that could even impact you uh, you know if it was closer to ground there there can be different if you're closer to ground you're not gonna have so many steps so you've got more space for uh, the window as well okay and um, got, if you're actually at ground level you don't even need the deck you just step out onto the ground have a couple of one or two steps at the door uh, so those are some of the differences, too, that occur. Another example here, uh, we've got uh, the, the deck. Uh, this is for a walkout condition. So here you've got, this is what I mean by walkout. Well, I don't need any stairs if I've got a full walkout. You know, I don't necessarily have to walk out from the first floor. Uh, or I might not have space to effectively walk out from the first floor. Or maybe I do want to have a stairs down, then I'd have to have a different layout. I'd probably have to have 
this come out to here, maybe the stairs come out to the front or to the back towards you. So there'd be different layout design, but they're showing that's not the option. You just got a uh, patio up here, like a little deck, and then this would be your walkout to ground if it's a walkout basement. So different views. So then if you're looking at this, this is this. It's above ground. So you have to also visualize, all right, I'm looking at the first floor plan. That deck is not below that. This is the foundation plan. This is where that deck is. So it helps you to visualize what you're, what you're um, looking at that way. And again, you can see all the details. This is your brick. There's your airspace. There's your there's your uh, frame wall and the SB is solid bearing, solid bearing. So there must be a beam. If we went back and we looked at the floor plans, we would see that um, from that perspective. So just giving you a number of those kind of details. Here there's a few details for the engineered floor. Uh, plan view at sill plate and basically just referring to the uh, rim board that's going on the outside of the engineered truss joist, how the truss joists tie in. Another detail with um, your flashing underneath the brick. This X is showing you a weep, a weep hole there. And now that you're familiar with those terms, this is showing the insulation going down below grade to the basement. Uh, and of course, any details like a squash block, uh, those kind of things, they will also be part of the engineered uh, flooring supplier, whoever is manufacturing the floor. And they're going to have shop drawings and they're going to be stamped. So you got to make sure that you're following their stamped shop drawings. If this says one thing and the engineered floor system with the engineer's stamp says another, you got to follow their floor system for that. If there's some discrepancy because you're missing a column or something, yeah, you got to get that all sorted out between the architect and the floor system that you've ordered. But you can't sort of get the, the drawings from the engineered floor system and then ignore them and start following a different set of drawings. So that would supersede what this says about the floor system, right? Um, but very likely it's going to be similar for the little bit that they've showed. Um, it just gives an indication that these details would be for an engineered floor system and this is typical about how you would see it on the outside. There's your 150 millimeters above ground. See how it says 12 inches maximum there? Well, that's not a building code thing. The 12 inches maximum, that would be uh, usually a builder thing. It could be an architectural control thing. Uh, it's for looks, right? There's nothing wrong with durability of a concrete wall being higher. But if it's too high, it looks ugly, right? So they'll have, uh, usually builders will have a limit and they'll try to have the cut in the foundation wall work out so that it's in that zone. It can't be it can't be less than six inches on a brick wall, but it could be more. And they're saying to keep it to 12 inches maximum. So it's just um, that that side of um, the detailing that's provided there. So hopefully that's giving you a, a good idea of how construction details work and the information you see on it. You're starting to get an idea like right away you'd be thinking, okay, this looks like it's a steel column. Um, what is going on with this PL? It's a point load. You're starting to think about what is this information uh, occurring? And probably this is more important coming from wherever it is on the floor plan. So I wouldn't be too worried about that here because this is really giving you the information you need uh, with regards to um, the decks and how the decks are being placed, whether it's a walkout or whether it's a semi walkout um, or just a uh, regular sort of deck on the back of the house. And so you, you also notice too, by the way, visualizing the construction drawings. Look at this. When you look at this, most of you would think this is against the wall, right? So you would think the stairs is against the wall. But when you look at the plan view, the stairs is not against the wall. See, look at that. It's got like 30 inches before it starts, right? So there's a bit of a space in there that allows that window to be a little bit behind the stairs gives a little bit extra flexibility for that uh, window there too, um, depending on how many risers you have. So you got what, one, two, three, it's got to cut it, it's got to cut a break line there, three, four, and you'd have the top, which would be five, one, two, three, four, five, six here. I thought there was one extra here because look, this is right to the edge of the window. And here, this is actually, it's actually, um, 
it's actually before the edge of the window. So um, that's the difference. That's okay because they're not saying it's a particular amount of risers and they've got a break line in between here. So that's okay. I'm just pointing out some of the little inconsistencies that you might see and they might catch you and you get um, a little bit confused with that. But definitely you wanna look at the plan views, you wanna look at the elevation views and you don't get depth with orthographic drawings, constructability wise, you don't get depth. So you better be looking at dimensions and uh, the different viewpoints and really trying to come to grips with how things fit together. And also it's good to utilize the information that's in the construction notes and try to visualize the construction notes. Like if I'm, if I'm doing this, I can basically draw this frame wall out. If it's brick veneer, I can draw it out pretty much from the outside to the inside, step by step, because it's telling me um, pretty much uh, from the outside to the inside. And if something's not in the right spot, I should be able to ask a question. That doesn't seem right. What's wrong here? Uh, that contravenes building code. That's not right. And they meant to have it here. So you've got to have a good enough understanding that if there's these little sort of um, variables that um, you don't get caught with them. And that takes a little bit of time and a little bit of experience to come with it. And do you never get caught with some things? No, I still get caught with things all the time. Uh, usually not typical standard things, but some little bit something a little bit out of the ordinary things you can. So much better to ask questions. If you're not sure, do a little sketch of something, fire it off to the consultant with an RFI, get a clarification before you actually start to build it. Uh, so from a constructability point of view, that's very important um, to make sure that those things are done. I think I mentioned before that certain items like um, stair sizes, rise, run, minimum rise, minimum run, minimum tread. So this, this particular designer very typically always puts straight from the building code all of these measurements here, which is great uh, because it's there. It's easy to access uh, for anybody that's um, doing the work. They got no excuse, uh, not that they have an excuse anyways. So that's important too. And you see here, all construction practices to comply with Ontario Building Code re regulations, right? Um, so that's like a broad statement that is saying, here you go, this is uh, the drawings, but you make sure that everything is in compliance with the building code. If there's something that doesn't seem right, ask us the question, right? So that's very typical to be found on drawings, as is not to scale. Okay, so I hope that's given you a little bit more understanding of details and how you can sort of fit details with, you know, floor plans and cutting plane lines and looking inside and step by step visualizing. And if in doubt, trying to draw out what it would look like to you and get used to sketching these things so that it becomes much more comfortable uh, a process uh, to do. And then you start visualizing it and then you start seeing it and you start seeing it before it's built. And so that's that vision. And so uh, as Stephen Covey said, start with the end in mind and then you can work backwards, right? And that also ties to a lot of lean construction principles too that we call pull planning. So we look at the end and we work our ways backwards. What do we need next? What do we need next? What do we need next? And then it's kind of like to, what do we do now? And that's a step-by-step -step process. So have a wonderful day. It's Tom Stevenson signing off for now and we're going to see you next time in our next lecture. Bye for now.